find this time. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back from holidays. And uh, we'll start very slow to warm up. So just to give you the overall plan is that um, I'll take over the next few weeks. So first I'll continue with resource theories. Uh, then I'll talk about the paradoxes part of the lecture. And then Ralph will come back towards the end to talk about quantum clocks. Just so you know more or less what to expect. And the paradox is a bit disconnected from the rest, but in terms of uh, our time, it worked better this way. So let me uh, recap where we were in resource theories, and, uh, and then today we'll talk about different ways to quantify resources. Okay, so what did we have so far? A resource theory is defined by some constraints, so they could be operational. And please, please interrupt me all the time. So they could be operational constraints, or they could be physical things, or they could be just a matter of accounting. So for example, uh, so this defines the allowed operation, sorry. Allowed operations, all right. So for example, in quantum information theory, you talked about LOCC, where the goal is to study entanglement or quantum correlations. So we only allowed local operations among like Alice and Bob, uh, locally for Alice and Bob and classical communication between them, right? And everything else uh, we have to pay for. So in, for example, in terms of a uh, number of bell pairs that we need to use up to create some state. Yep. This is what um, you've talked a bit in, in QIT. Here we talked about noisy operations. which is a theory that tries to explain like uh, what's the value of pure states, right? So we only allow for unitary operations that don't change the entropy, and then we allow to bring in mixed states, fully mixed states. And then we talked about thermal operations. Which is something where we want to quantify uh, kind of en both energy and entropy, so and workflows and heat flows and all of this. So we only allowed for unitaries that conserve uh, the total uh, energy of a system. And we allowed to bring in Gibbs state. So we assume that you have access to some environment, right? And this is, noisy operations can be seen as a limit of thermal operations if all the Hamiltonians are always degenerate. Or if you're at infinite temperature. One of these is more physical than the other. Then, we have what could be our potential resources. Which you call kind of the state space. Yes. Right. And here, in the case of LOCC, we had some weird states. For example, your resources could be all the bipartite density matrices. Right? And you want to know which are more valuable than others. In noisy operations, we can, for example, we can fix the system size and then we just care about density matrix in, in a given system. And in thermal operations, we don't care just about the state of the system, we also care about what is the Hamiltonian, right? Because the same density matrix, depending on the Hamiltonian, may, may allow you to do more or fewer things. We talked about free states. These were the states that from, you could always go from any row to this free state. Right? Uh, which in LOCC are all the separable states. You can always create them via local operations in classical communication, no matter what the initial state is. In noisy operations, it's the uniform state. And in thermal operations is the Gibbs state, right? 
almost directly from the definition. Uh. Huh? What am I doing? Okay. And then we saw that if we just have these states, so we have this set of states and this allow transformations, this defines a, a kind of order on the states which is, in particular, pre-order of this sort, maybe from some row. You can create some sigma. Right, which just tells you which states you can transform to each other. Right? And maybe at the end, they can all come down to the states. Right? But it's not necessarily totally ordered. It can be very, very messy. And the goal is to kind of try to get some insight into this. So in LOCC, you, we cannot, it's not easy to characterize the whole thing. But if we say, well, let's just consider pure states on Alice and Bob for pure OAB, then the order was given by majorization. of the reduced density matrices. Right? You did this in QIT, so I will not prove this again. You remember this? So you did the, you took this thing, you took the Schmidt rank, blah, blah. If you measurize each other, then you could find the thing, right? Uh, here, it's again, it's majorization of uh, the eigenvalues of of rho, which we called x. Uh, and in this case, we went through this long procedure of mapping, embedding this problem so th into a bigger one, into a bigger space, so that we could kind of map this situation to, again, to noisy operations. And we concluded this is uh, what we call thermal marginalization. Right, of um, of again of the eigenvalues of of this thing, right? Where now we weighed it, they were weighed in a special way, in such a way that the Gibbs state corresponded to um, a uniform uh, vector here. Okay, and then we were looking. The thing we did before was to then look for monotones. And monotones are just a way to give us some insight into this order, so some necessary condition for state transformation. So saying that if uh, rho goes to sigma, then for sure some function of this function must, uh, you know, either always increase or always decrease, depending on the function, right? So here, for LOCC, you talked in, in quantum information theory, you talked about squash entanglement, I think, as an example. Yeah. If you didn't take QIT, then don't worry. I'm just giving this example to, to show that resource series can be applied to more than just thermodynamics. Uh, in this case, we discover that it's about sure convex functions or concave, depending on, on the sign here, if it's increasing or decreasing. And one example were all these Rennie entropies. And here, for this case, again, this thermal marginalization is just for block diagonal states. We will talk 
either tomorrow or next week about uh, coherent states. So in this case, uh, we found another, a new definition, which was things that respect this thermal majorization. And that's, I don't remember what name I gave them, but kind of thermal short convex functions which you proved in the exercise class that all these Rennie free energies uh, were monotonic on this, on this order defined by the thermal majorization, right? And we saw that in order to visualize these things, we looked at these Lorentz curves. We'll, we'll come back to the Lorentz curves later in, in, the, in the day. Okay, so this is what we did so far. But now note that this is not, I mean, it gives us some characterization of this messy preorder, but it's not a lot of information, right? It's just something that I can check to see, to rule out some state transformations, right? It, you know, if I just take one entropy of here or one free energy of this and one free of that, and it's largely, it does not necessarily alone tell me that I can transform the state, and it doesn't tell me how I can transform the states. So we're going to look for something a bit more, um, more concrete, and that will take us to the subject of currencies. So, which are just another way to characterize resource theories. So let me first give you some examples. Maybe in LOCC you talked about things like entanglement of formation, which was how many bell pairs do Alice and Bob need to share in order to create some state row AB. Did you talk about this? No? Okay, so let me give some examples. In LOCC, bell pairs, and you ask questions like, like what's the minimum n uh, such that I can take and bell pairs, imagine that this is a density matrix, to some row AB through LOCC. Yeah. This, was, this is what is called entanglement of formation. So what's the cost of this thing in terms of number of bell pairs? Or the other thing was called, the other notion that is very used is uh, distillation entanglement, which is, well, if I have Roy B, you know, m m maybe some random state is not very useful, but I know that bell pairs are very useful because then I can use teleportation to, to do this kind of transformation. So I can ask, well, how many bell states can I extract from a state? Okay. And this, this is kind of like, what is the cost of rho in terms of, in terms of this, this currency, which is bell pairs. And this is what is kind of the yield of rho b, okay. which are not the same in general. So it's the same like, Think of a resource theory of just uh, economics and think, for example, well, this is a bicycle. I want to buy a bicycle. What is the cost of the bicycle in terms of a currency, money, Swiss francs? And this is like, and how much can I get if I sell my bicycle? Okay. And why was this useful? Well, because we know that if you have enough bell pairs, then we can produce any state via uh, this kind of teleportation um, um, protocols. Good. But another example that you talked about, although not in the context of noisy operations, but you can talk about it like this, was information compression or state compression. Which was 
the notion of, well, maybe I have some, some state row s, and I want to compress it so that I can free up some, some qubits of, my, of the memory of where I store this. But I want to go only via unitary operations to um, some row s1 prime and leaving all the other qubits uh, s2 prime, right? And this would be the max over n of this, right? So you talked about this in the case of channel coding, for example, I think. When you have, you have some state, but you want to compress it in a way that later you can reverse it, but you don't need as many qubits to send, to send this information. And I don't know if you remember um, what was the maximum value of n. This was, this was log of the dimension of the system minus the max entropy. Right, because the max entropy tells you the rank of this matrix, which tells you like how many qubits you need here um, to support it, and then the rest are free. And then you can talk also about the same thing. You can also talk about, well, what is the minimum in N such that I can take How many pure qubits do I need via noisy operations in order to create some row S? Okay. And I imagine that if I want to keep the system dimensions, it will be, uh, I'll get some trash here. Some, right. And this we'll see later on that this will be given by log D minus the min entropy. So, these are examples of something that's called currency. So I'll talk now a bit more generally about what, um, what this is. In th oh no, let me just say one more thing. Let me just give you one more example. In thermodynamics, you ask how much work do I need in order to create a, a quantum state? Okay. And you can think about this like saying, well, I have a weight at some height, okay, and times maybe a Gibbs state here. What is the minimum n such that I can do I can use the work here to create here my, the row that I want in my system. Okay. So like I, I have some weight, how much do I have to lower it if I want to create some state from starting from a thermal state, for example. Okay. This would be an example of saying, oh, what's the cost of this in terms of, of this currency, which is work? We will go into, if you don't get it now, don't worry, because we'll get into all the details later on. This is more just to motivate it. Sorry. Yeah. What's the Oh. <laughs> you mean this? On the left side, right? Okay, here? Yeah. Was it here? Okay, I'll write it there again. <laughs> okay, so suppose that, suppose that your work system I'll, I'll do it properly. So suppose that your work system is like a harmonic oscillator, some delta, and, and, right, you've seen this in Ralph's lectures, for example, this is your battery. And then you can say, well, maybe my, I call state n if, if this thing is in a pure state at height n. I says I'm here at it. I, I did, right? This is the same as saying, well, I store energy n times this delta on my battery. 
And then I can ask questions like, uh, what is the minimum n such that I can take this n in my work battery tensor, maybe nothing on my system that I want to go, so the, the Gibbs state on S to zero on my work thing, tensor, the state that I want to create. Right. Or, so this would be the cost, or I can go do the other way around, so how much work can I extract from a state row S, which would be going from zero up to N. Up. And saying here, I don't, I don't care what's here, so let's say, for example, it's a thermal state. Okay. This is one notion, one kind of currency we could have, which is not like the other ones, because the other one is about copies of some elementary resource like the bell pairs. Another option is to have, well, instead of my battery being like this, I could have a battery that is just many qubits, and it has energy n or n times delta if it's in a state like this. Some are excited and some are not. So this is the other, let me just write the other option. So this would be the uh, equals a sum over i equals one to some big N of right, delta one one in i identity in the rest. So this would be this Hamiltonian. I have many qubits, each of them with some energy delta. And then I can say, well, my state of energy delta n corresponds to just having the first n qubits excited and the others in the, in the ground state. Right? So this would be 1, 1 in i. And let's say I have this from i equals 1 until n, and then I have all the others from i equals 1 plus n until the big n, the ground state. And then again, I can ask the same questions, right? So then I, again, I can ask, well, what's the minimum over n? such that I can go from a state like this uh, to alpha zero, my row S, and what's the maximum over N, such that I can go from row S to alpha N. Uh, right. So this tells me, if I start with some state here, how many of these qubits can I excite? So how, how much energy can I extract from here in a controlled way? So I know that these first qubits are all in the state one. And then I don't care about what happens to the error system. It can go to the thermal state, right? So it's really how much work can I extract? Right? So there's, in the literature, you'll find the two, the two models for currency. And maybe next week, we'll have an exercise about how they relate to each other. It's about the same. OK, so now, if you're OK with this example so far, then I'll give you now the overview of more generally what currencies are and what is the cost or in deal of resources like this. And then later, if we have time, we'll look at, we'll prove that thing there. Now, 
Is this all depending on having? Go to right. Okay. So then, what are currencies? So in the most abstract sense, where it doesn't even need to be quantum theory, could be any resources. It could be money, for example. My set of, this is like the set of currencies, just needs to be some kind of set of resources that are indexed by something that belongs in an interval that is uh, ordered. It could be many things, so it could be n, if it's, for example, number of qubits, or it could be r, or it could be q, or it could be just even some interval between a and b. As long as this is completely ordered, it's okay. And here's the idea. So somewhere in your very messy pre-order, you look for a set of resources that is completely ordered. So here's your alpha 0, alpha 1, alpha 2, and so on. So satisfy alpha n. Meaning, in particular, that if if I can go from one to the other, okay. and really think about, I, I like to think about uh, really money for this. So we have many resources, many things you can buy and sell and trade, etc. Um, but you cannot like compare apples to oranges. But money, you can always compare like three francs to five francs. This is completely ordered. And then you can use this to characterize the rest of the pre-order. Right. But for that, you need, you need some conditions. So um, you, need some, you need it to apply to some set of resources, to be universal at least to some subset of resources. Right. So the nice thing about money is that you can buy almost everything with it. Right. Maybe you can't buy love, so you cannot characterize the price of love with the currency money. But for everything else, you can. So it should be... Meaning that uh, for every row belonging to the subset of things you can buy with this money, I can call it S alpha. But, uh, <laughs> there exists always some N that with enough money, with enough of this, you can go to your row to your stage, okay. and the other way around. Okay. Which tells us that this should include, um, ideally it should include the, the, uh, the free state. OK. okay. Do, 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 do. And then what this does, is that if you want to talk about, oh, is it possible to convert between some state rho or sigma? You can see, well, how much does it cost to get rho? From rho, maybe we can get, we can sell rho for some money. Then we can go from this money, lose some, and buy sigma. I'll tell you in a bit. I'll give you some examples. Okay. So just so you know, for example, um, in LOCC, if you take bell pairs in just bipartite LOCC, then it's universal for all states, right? Because of teleportation, doesn't matter what state you want to create, bipartite state, if you have enough bell pairs, you can use teleportation and create it. In thermal operations, that's not the case. So if I take these currencies that I showed you, right, states of a fixed energy in some weight, you cannot create coherent states with this, right? So then the subset of states that this currency applies to is just um, 
is just this block diagonal stage. Okay. So most complex resource theories are more like uh, cooking than like buying and selling things. So to create some state, you, you're going to need not just work, but also some coherence. In the same way that to make a cake, you need not just flour, but also some, some sort of milk. Right? So one currency will not be enough, but now, for now we'll focus on, on the ones that are, on the subsets for which it's enough. Okay, okay so then, ah, this works. So then we can define the cost of some row as just the min or the inf, depending on the resource theory of n such that you can do this. And the yield is like how much money I can make. Let's put n prime. Good. And then one can also look at um, noisy versions of this where we allow for some precision. So this would be, for example, uh, cost epsilon over all. Well, here, so such that you can create the state approximately with some precision epsilon. And this, the distance measure that you use depends on, like, what's your global theory like. So for quantum resource theories, normally you want to have the trace distance here because then it has nice properties um, when you look at many copies, which we'll talk about in a bit. Okay. So, for example, in QIT, maybe you talked about this uh, compression, but with some error where instead of the max entropy, you got the smooth max entropy there with some epsilon, and this would be uh, precisely that for the yield. Okay, so what are some properties of this? Well, if your resource theory is uh, non-trivial, like, doesn't have perpetual motions, which means like that you can really find the set that is totally ordered, um, then the cost of a resource must always be higher than the yield. Right. And, and why is that? Because you can start with this, because of this, right? You can start with this thing that costs um, the currency corresponding to how much money I need to buy row. I buy row, then I sell row, and I better have less money now than, than being up here, right? Otherwise, this set is not totally ordered. So I can go from cost of row to row. Yeah. But it also gives us uh, sufficient and necessary trans uh, conditions for state transformations. So in particular, if I can go from rho to sigma, uh, then the cost of rho must be larger and yield of sigma. And why is that? Because then I'm doing this. I can say, well, I start here. So this is alpha cost of rho. I go to rho. I go to sigma. From sigma, I can go okay, here to alpha yield of sigma. So this naturally needs to be lower than that. Otherwise, uh, again, it, this set is not totally ordered. Okay. 
So now note that even though like, no, I forgot another property, which is that cost and yield are monotons. This you can huh, leave as homework to prove. Um, so even though they are two different monotones, these are, it's an, another way to, to tell whether you can transform one state to the other. But it has an, there's another implication, which is, well, if the yield of rho is larger than the cost of sigma, then I can go from rho to sigma. And that is, let me draw it a bit differently now. Let's put the, let's put the row here. It is alpha yield of row. I go down to alpha of the sigma. And from here, I go to sigma. Okay. So just this part took, took, took. Okay. So now for the first time, we, we, we have a direct way to have a sufficient condition for state transformation. So for example, in noisy operations, you can see if the um, max entropy of rho is larger than the min entropy of sigma. The other way around, sorry. If the min, uh, which one is? If the max entropy of rho is smaller than the min entropy of sigma, then you can you can transform from rho to sigma. Which, which is a bit more useful than just having these monotones and having to check this whole family of, of monotones, right? Good. Uh, how are we doing for time? Okay. But something where it is much more even is to relate to conversion rates. So let me just recap what conversion rates are. I think we talked about this last time. Oh, well, the first time I talked about the resource series, which is conversion rates of rho to sigma is like, how many copies of rho can I transform to how many copies of sigma? So max. of R okay. so and we saw already that if if they're both positive meaning none of them is um, a free, a useless resource. And RT, the resource theory is non-trivial in the sense that you don't have this perpetual engine uh, things, then, then we saw that they must be the inverse of each other.
And the reason for this is because you can start, for example, from row and copies. From here, go from sigma r. Sigma, right? Just apply that. And from here, well, now I go from sigmas to rows, so I need to multiply this by the other way. And unless, unless rho is a free state and I can create this free state uh, arbitrarily, then this better be one. Well, this should be smaller or than one. I should not be able to create um, these states for free. If I can, then no worries, because one of, this one of these rates will be zero. And then I do the same for sigma. Uh, and again, this should be small. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, and now the, the um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. can I actually prove that it must be one. Well, for the for the currencies, I can prove it. For now, I just prove it must be smaller than one. Okay, let me get back to this tomorrow. Uh, I <coughs> so. And the idea of using currencies is that instead of computing, having to compute this quantity for every pair of rho and sigma, instead we go via this intermediate resource. So we go from rho um, to the end to one of these alphas that is in the currency, and from here to sigma copies. Okay. And then the idea being that if the, if the again if the theory is reversible overall and let's say for now that alpha n Okay, so now we limit ourselves to a special case. Let's forget about um, the one I erased. So let's forget about currencies like the weight, and let's think about just this, the ones like bell pairs and noisy operations for now, where, where for example, here, alpha 2 is two copies of bell pairs. Alpha 3 is three copies of bell pairs. And here, again, the same. Three pure qubits, four, cub four pure qubits, right? So then the idea is that to go from Go to the n, to alpha, to the n times this ratio from going from rho to alpha, and from here going to sigma to the n to alpha of sigma, uh, alpha to sigma. Yeah, this is true for reversible resource series, and we'll see that is the case for, for those things there. Okay. So, uh, bo -bo -bo. in this case, then, it's going to be equal to R. Yeah. I'll let you out in a moment. I'll just finish here. And this is going to be
four reversible resource series, which, which are resource series where in this asymptotic limit of many copies, the cost and yield are, uh, are the same. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about this a bit after the break. Okay, so we take a break now, five minutes-ish, and then we'll go into more detail on this. Okay, maybe let's slowly restart. Um, okay, so there are some caveats on on this holding, on this being an equality and not an inequality. And this is the case of, of um, this holds for resource series that are asymptotically reversible, meaning that asymptotically I can go from you know, row to the n to something else and then come back to row to the n as long as this is not um, a free state, right? As long as this, this, ratio, this rate is larger than, than zero. Uh, so, <sighs> but we'll see one way to get this. The, Okay, good. Uh, good, so now let's see how we get from this single shot costs to this conversion rate. Okay. And so I can think of this rate of rho to alpha as just the limit when n goes to infinity of 1 over n times, so I go from rho to alpha, so it's the yield of rho. Right? Because the yield of rho is from rho, how many, sorry, the yield of rho to the end. Rho to the end. And the idea is that, well, in many resource series, if you allow for a little uh, epsilon precision here, then the yield and the cost will converge in the asymptotic limit, and they converge to something that is very familiar. So for, so idea, allow for, Precision epsilon and use uh, for large n that we get to. Of even though in the single shot case you can't do this, if you have many, many copies, you'll be able to do this. So let me give you an example that will be familiar. So let's take the example of noisy operations. Where I told you for now, I just told you later, we'll, we will uh, prove it that you have that the cost of rho s is logarithm of the dimension minus the mean entropy if you allow for an epsilon tolerance. Uh, so what is the limit when n goes to infinity of 1 over n cos epsilon of rho s. Well, this is 1 over n 
times log of the new dimension, which is d to the n. So this is just this is just log d. And then here you have of n going to infinity, one over n over s. But this one, you know, from quantum information theory. That in this limit, when we have many, many copies, and we allow for a little error tolerance, then this is just the von Neumann entropy. Right? You did this, at least you proved it for the classical case. You probably talked about it for the quantum case, that there's this convergence, right? And we do the same for... We do the same for the yield. So then the limit of n going to infinity and So here you get log d again, and here you get h of rho s, where this is the von Neumann entropy because this thing converges to the von Neumann entropy. All right. So when you have this, now, now look that this is like the this is the rate of going from uh, rho to alpha in the case where alpha is, is of the sort of many copies, and this is rate of alpha sigma. So then the conclusion in this case is that if I want to go from rho to sigma via this process, well, this cost me what? Log d minus h of rho. Log d minus h of sigma. So this tells me how many copies of sigma I can create given these copies of, uh, of rho. Assuming that the resource theory is, uh, is tight, which in this case it is, and, and assuming you go by this process. Right. So in the case of thermal operations, it's going, to be, it's going to be more or less the same. So we will prove it, I think, tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I should be able to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. In this thing, you can just you can just call the this thing like. the average cost or the rate cost of creating each of them. So that's the idea that like even though in the in the single shot limit, because of all sorts of finite size effects, there there's a gap between cost and yield. If you have many, many copies, you can do all this kind of compression technique so that uh, you can always uh, you can go back to where you came from if you have wrote to the end. This is, of course, not a property of any resource theory you can come up with, but for noisy operations, it's true. For LOCC with bipartite states, it's true. For thermal operations, 
in block diagonal states, it's also true. So we will see, uh, I think, tomorrow. Or I'll give you in the, for the exercise class next week because the proof is a bit, it's straightforward, but it's a bit annoying. That for block diagonal states, you have that, uh, It's when, remember we defined all these alpha free energies and it's the one with infinity. And this converges for converges to f of x minus f of g. g being the the thermal ordered Gibbs state and that the yield is the same for a different value of alpha. So this this really correspond again to the to the min and max entropies. But if you remember in the definition of these free energies, uh, there was a part of the entropy and then there was a part uh, corresponding to energy and the entropy part is essentially corresponding to this. Which, in the same limit, goes to this. Which tells us again that the conversion rate between two states is just this difference between the Helmholtz free energies Okay, so this is the power of you trying to use entropies to, to characterize the resource series that it gives you tighter conditions to check state transformations and it gives you easier conditions to, to look at conversion rates between resources. Um, yeah. And there have... There are interesting cases to why the uh, there can be many reasons to why the cost and the yield uh, are not tight. One could be that your currency is just too coarse grained. So, for example, imagine that you only had uh, five franc coins. Okay, everyone only dealt in five franc coins, and you want to buy something that costs maybe fourteen francs, so you need to pay three coins. But then, if you want to sell it, you, yeah. Right. If you sell it, you only get two coins back for it. That's maybe not the best example. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. That's not the best example, but it's something that happens in um, in LOCC. So there are states that are not separable states. So they violate Bell inequalities, for example. And that um, still you cannot, it doesn't matter how many states you have, how many copies you have of this, you cannot create bell pairs, not even one single bell pair with them. Uh, there should be somewhere the other option. Where's the ball? Hmm? Oh, I see now. Yeah, too late. So what does this tell us? Well, maybe bell states are not the best currency. But maybe it's, it's, it's a property of, of quantum theory at that scale. We don't know. Um, 
Oh yeah, maybe an easier example is to look at work extraction with this kind of finite gap batteries. Yeah, maybe that's a much better example than, than buying and selling. With this finite gap energy, if maybe you have a gap of one joule between things, you need to create something, an excited state here of like, with a gap of one point half, so you need to use at least two, start with at least energy two here. But if you want to take energy from here, you can only get one back. And this tells you, oh, well, maybe you should use a more fine-grained uh, battery, a battery with like closer GK. Okay, so in the time we have left, we'll just start proving this um, the single shot cost in yield for noisy operations. And then we will, do, do, do. I'll give you, I guess homework or we do it tomorrow to do it for thermal operations. So, And there's many ways to prove this, and today we're going to look at via these Lorentz curves because we spent some time introducing them, so why not? So first, let's just see what happens to a state when we compose it with a mixed state or with a pure state, what happens to the Lorentz curve. Okay, so for example, if I have uh, rho times say n fully mixed qubit, Remember that I only need to look at the vectors of eigenvalues, so the vectors are, suppose that the eigenvalues of rho are kind of x1, x2, x3. And of this thing, this is gonna be uh, one, two to the n, one, 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 right? It's like the diagonal of this, uh, of this matrix. Yes? So, if I now order this big vector, so, this, so maybe I write it like this properly. So this is one, two to the n, and then we have x1, x2, x3, x1, x2, x3, pa 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 pa. This many times. But what matters for majorization is the ordered version of this. So if I order it, supposing that this was already ordered, so x1 is larger than x2, then x3, then I get x1, then start the x2, x2, uh, then start the x3, x3. And this is all divided by this number, right? What happens if instead, if I have rho times pure state in a qubit, uh, but now n qubit, n pure qubits, then I have, again, x1, x2, x3. This thing is just one and a bunch of zeros. So then the state that I'll get going to be x1, x2, x3, and then a bunch of zeros, right? So now I draw the Lorentz curves of these two. So let's draw this one that's easier. So first we go to, remember this is x1 is the first point. The next point is going to be 
uh, here, for example, x1 plus x2. Let me make it slightly smaller slope like this. And then we have x1 plus x2 plus x3, which if the state is normalized, this should be 1. So this is, and then <laughs> right until the end, it's x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus 0 here, plus another 0 there, and so on. Yeah? So that's this curve. So this is corresponds to the end. What about the other curve? I'll do it in blue. Mm. Yeah, blue. No. I'll do it in red. Okay. So now it's going to be x1 over 2 to the n. Okay. And after, boo, 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 I think 2 to the n instances, so if I appear, if this is 1, 2, blah, 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 after 2 to the n instances, I finally reach x1. So it's going to be a straight line okay, where this is x1 over 2 to the n, this is x1 over 2 to the n plus x1 over 2 to the n, and so on, until I finally reach there. Then after another 2 to the n, I'm finally past all of this. It's a nice. And then I reach here. Yeah. This, uh, this line should be less steep than the other line, so. Let me try to do it a bit here. Ah, that's better. Okay. And then and please tell me if I got the scaling factor wrong, but I think I didn't. Then I got Finally, here. Okay. This is the dimension. So this is the total dimension of the system for both cases. So what do I get? And this will be relevant for later. This, this is clearly a straight line. So what I get is that when I compose something with a fully mixed stage, the, the Lorentz curve just kind of extends, right? So the, composing with the pure state is kind of a compressed version in the x-axis compared to this one. Is that clear? Why? Okay. Okay, so then I'll just write it down. What is n kinemids? Of So why do we care about this? Because now we want to know, for example, so to compute the yield. 
So I want to end up, I start with row, and I want to end up with some n pure qubits, right? And now, of course, like this is a, this is some w for my work, my noisy work. Um, and now, in order to be able to use um, this kind of formalism with the Lorentz curves, the system dimensions need too much. So I need to put something here to match this dimension. So let's say, uh, doo -doo -doo. the only thing I can have for free is fully mixed state. So, and, and here, of course, at the end, I can end up with anything. But I can always go to from whatever is here for free to a uh, to fully mixed state. So let me put here the fully mixed state on S so divided by the dimension of S. Okay. D is the dimension of S, and let's say that this is. I don't know. Let's let's keep it like this. Okay. So this is the computation that I'm trying to do. So then, what are the relative Things. I want to compress and extend this curve until I find the following. So what is the Lorentz curve of this? Well, this thing here is just a straight line because it's a fully mixed state, so here's one. Whoop. Very straight line until the dimension of D. Right. Took. So this is my goal state. And now, yeah, this is the Lorentz curve of my initial state, but now it's kind of expanded, right? So for example, in this case, maybe my original state was something like took, 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 but now it's very much expanded. So maybe it's took, took, took because I have too many of this, right? So in this case, if this is, so I put, this is the red one, okay? If these are the two Lorentz curves, then I cannot go from the red to the green, right? Because the majorization condition means that I can only go down in the curve, okay? So what does this mean? It means I was too ambitious and I tried to, I tried to take out uh, too many pure qubits. So I'm now looking for making this end smaller and smaller until this curve, until I kind of compress this curve such that it's totally above this, right? So then. For something like chook, chook, chook. Uh, uh, maybe let's try to make it even closer like this. So I look for the yeah for the largest n, right? So I want to maximize n such that this curve is still above this curve, meaning that I can do this transformation. Right? So now I look at what are the what are the values here. So what is this? This is just the dimension of s. Right, in the same case as here, right? I'm just doing, um, sorry, yes. I'm just taking my initial state, right? And then composing it with this, which means that I just get my initial curve and then a straight line on top. But the initial curve of this is that thing where here is one and here is the dimension of my system, right? It's a uniform state. Okay, so then I need that D is larger or equal than this thing that we get here. But what is this? Well, first I need to look to where did my original density matrix reach one? Right? And then, 
And when does it originally reach one? So that's so this is D. And this is well D minus rank of rho, right? But because I expanded it, it's multiplied by two to the n. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. Because I know that whatever happens here, as long as these points are, as long as this point is before this point, then this curve will always be above that because the, the uniform state is the lowest possible curve between two states, right? Because it's a straight line. Okay. Good. Uh, from here. Let me see if... We get this right. This is just h max of rho s. Okay. So the log of the rank is h max of rho s. And this is the condition that you get at the end. And the homework is to get from here to here. Okay, and I can fix it again in the next lecture. That's very messy. Uh, to go the other way around would be then again to do the same. So. To look at the cost, I'm looking at the minimum um, of n, such that I can go from, again, 0 to the n, n pure qubits, to my rho in s. And because I need to make the dimensions match, I just put here three states, s times d, and here. Uh, sorry. So now I'm looking at something different. Now I want to make this curve now I want to make this curve lie above the, the other one. So here's my initial state, but very but very this is a blue one, very expanded, and I want to make um, sorry, I want to make uh, this curve above that, but I want to minimize s as much as I uh, sorry, n as much as I can because I don't want to use so many pure qubits. So I want to compress the blue one as much as I can. Okay? And then you'll see, and because we're running out of, we'll, we'll do this properly uh, in the next lecture, we'll see that then the one thing that matters is just the first eigenvalue of this. Right, so at the end of the day, it, you're going to end up with n. Mm -hmm must be larger than, again, log d minus uh, right, 
log of x1, which is the, the highest eigenvalue of this thing. Again, for the same reason. And this is the min entropy. So, I was not expecting to get so fast, so I did not prepare the proof, but we'll do this in the next lecture. For the thermal operations, it's about the same. The difference is that when you do these kind of compositions with pure states or mixed states, the, um, the scaling is not by a factor of, of 2 to dn, but it's by a factor that depends on the partition function of the, uh, of the system that you add. So instead of compressing by, the, by the, the dimension of the system you add or expanding by this dimension, you compress by something that depends on the Gibbs state. So then when you, when you try to match the two curves, getting them as close possible, then the thing that matters, for example, yeah, the factor that you get here depends on the Gibbs state, and so you get the entropy from here. From here you get some some factor of the energy, and that's what gives you then the difference in the free, um, in the free energies. Okay. So I will sketch that proof tomorrow, and then I'll send the whole thing as homework for next week. And then what I really want to do tomorrow is not this, but to talk about coherence. Because so far we only talked about, yeah, we have this resource that's work, and uh, we want to know how much work we need to create a state or another state, but there's something else that matters if you want to go out of this block diagonal state, which is the coherence. So we'll talk about how to combine these two resources to create a full resource tier of thermodynamics with the caveat that this is still very much an active research topic. So, you know, people have not yet agreed on the right framework to study this, and all the results are full of little, you know, technical caveat, so it's not super ready for being taught as a lecture, but I can give you at least the uh, overview. Okay. Good, so with this I release you for lunch. Uh, the conclusion is that resource theories are another way to characterize, uh, sorry, currencies are another way to characterize resource theories and to get cost of conversion. Good. Uh, thanks.